Thank you very much, uh, Zim, and thank you to all of you for making time during this lunchtime. You can probably see from that uh, messy pile of paper that uh, this is a messy topic. It's a messy topic uh, because of the political context uh, in which the bill is tabled. It's also a messy topic uh, because of the complexity of the legislation. So let me start with the former, uh, in terms of the messiness of the political context. Um, we have, at the federal level, uh, in terms of regulation of political finance, uh, in my view, a uh, rather laissez-faire regulation that has allowed the flourishing of laissez-faire practices. And over the years, uh, there's been commentary and push to have a more robust regulation of this political funding. So you would have seen periodically reportage of uh, major parties uh, selling excess on influence um, and the criticisms that follow from that. And more recently, you would have seen reportage in terms of uh, uh, donors that have, are alleged to have close links with the Chinese Communist Party uh, government uh, and the access they've, they've received at the high levels of government uh, of both parties, and in particular in relation to uh, Senator, uh, uh, former Senator, now former Senator, Senator Desiari. Des and more generally, this takes uh, place in a context where there's, of course, a bit of, fair bit of controversy in terms of uh, the Chinese Communist Party government's uh, so-called soft power activities and also global concern for inter foreign government interference in elections. Think, for example, in terms of the, the controversy surrounding the Russian government's interference, uh, alleged interference with the U uh, American elections. Now, there's only one strand of this messy political context. Now, this strand is a long-running campaign, long-running in the sense of perhaps dating back to 2010, uh, um, waged uh, initially primarily by uh, Senator Eric Abetz to have get up uh, labeled as an associated entity of the Labour Party or the Greens or both, yeah? And this is really a uh, campaign that really gathered much more uh, steam since GetUp began targeting coalition candidates in the last federal election, a strategy that is going to continue with, uh, with the next uh, federal election. Now, the third strand is this, that we have uh, at least a strong perception within the charity sector that they're under attack. Yes? So you have, for example, um, a recent report, uh, Civil Voices report by uh, Sarah Madison and Andrew Carson of this uni uh, university, which reports as rife self-censorship amongst the charity sector, uh, really in response, a sort of perception of what they think they requ are required to do in terms of the stance of the government. And the other aspect of this particular uh, feeling, uh, feeling under siege is the appointment of Gary Johns, uh, former Labour uh, Party minister, as an Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commissioner. Now, why is this significant? Because he's, he's considered, to quote, to be a long-time anti-charity campaigner. And of course, we've got this broader context in terms of a decline in level of trust in government, uh, strands of populism uh, uh, gaining steam, uh, some of which uh, have quite strongly xenophobic aspects. And in this messy political context, we have the government uh, proposing around middle of last year to deal with so-called foreign uh, political donations. And that particular call came off the back of a report that was handed down by the Federal Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters that, broadly speaking, recommended the banning of foreign political donations. And on, on December last year, this bill was introduced with two other pieces of legislation to deal with uh, foreign interference in our political process. And the point we're at now is that this bill to, uh, uh, that I'm going to be uh, examining is subject of inquiry by the Federal Joint Standing C uh, Committee on Electoral Matters, and it's attracted quite a remarkable number of submissions. So you have actually uh, uh, probably the most number of submissions I've seen in terms of electoral law inquiry with 145 submissions on this particular bill coming from a range of organizations. So that is the context. Then let me, oops. <coughs> move now to this rather complicated bill. The thing to stress at the outset is that there are two distinct, albeit interacting objectives underlying the bill. The first objective you see uh, in that first paragraph is really is, is the one aimed at dealing with foreign interference. And it's really couched in terms of this principle that about restricting the ability to influence the political process 
uh, specifically the ability to make political donations to those who are seen to have meaningful connection to this country. Yeah? The other objective is distinct, like I say, or interact shortly, is really about dealing with what is uh, termed third parties. Yeah? So these are uh, political actors, or more specifically political organizations that do not stand for office, yeah? but nevertheless are participants and sometimes highly significant participants in the electoral arena. Yeah? You think get up, you can think about the Minerals Council for Australia, think about the trade unions, so on and so forth. So you have these two objectives that gives rise to a bill of some degree of complexity. And there are five, in my view, there are five main uh, uh, components of the bill, two of which I will, I will focus on in this presentation, just really by re for reasons of time. The first is a registration scheme for so-called third party campaigners and political campaigners. And I'll explain shortly what those two things mean. Yeah. The second is a change in provisions that have been in existence for quite a long time, uh, provisions dealing with associated entities. Associated entities, and I'll make this point shortly, are really entities that seem to be associated to a political party. Yeah? So what I will consider as basic organizations are de facto extension of a political party. So the changes in terms of definition and also a proposal to introduce a registration regime for the associated entities. The third component builds upon the disclosure scheme that again has been in existence for a number of decades now and really increases the disclosure obligations in certain ways. Yeah? The fourth component, and this perhaps is the fourth component that's received the, the least attention, is really changes in terms of the maximum amount of election funding that's available to eligible political parties. Yeah? The fifth component is really the most controversial component, yeah? And it really feeds off, the, uh, it really uh, uh, steps off the platform, the registration regime, and these are the restrictions dealing with so-called foreign political donations. So let me focus my attention on the first and the last component. There currently is, sorry, before I do that, I suppose I think it's crucial for me to sort of flag one of the anchor points in terms of my analysis, yeah, in terms of these provisions. Um, and there are two anchor points in terms of my assessment of this bill. Uh, the first are uh, four democratic principles that I've uh, relied upon in analyzing this area for quite some time. Um, the first is about protecting the integrity of representative government. And included in this particular principle is really preventing uh, various forms of corruption. The second is promoting fairness in politics, in particular elections. Uh, the third is uh, supporting political parties to discharge their democratic functions. And the fourth is respect for political freedoms, specifically freedom of political association and freedom of political expression. The second anchor point is really in understanding the ecosystem of political finance laws as being based on an integrated scheme of dealing with various types of political actors. Yeah? And understanding there are different rationales that for regulating different types of political actors and also different levels of regulation for different kinds of political actors. So, so take the, the most straightforward example. When we think about um, those who compete in elections, yeah? So we think about political parties and candidates. The activity that triggers the, regu uh, the regulatory treatment, if you like, is their standing for office, yeah? And for the major parties, of course, they are the, the, re the reality and the real likelihood of them actually exercising public power, yeah? Associated entities. Associated entities, as I said to you, could be understood just as de facto extensions of political parties. Yeah? So you think, for example, in the reportage that you might have, uh, have read, um, organizations that fundraise for political parties, yeah? or organizations that actually undertake uh, investments for, on behalf of the parties. They're set up as legally separate organizations, but they're basically controlled for by the party and operate for the benefit of the party. Yeah? 
And the rationale for regulating them in a way is similar to the rationale for uh, regulating political parties. They're just extensions, a de facto, not de jure, uh, not in de jure terms, but de facto extensions of the political parties. Now, where it becomes a bit more uh, contested and controversial is with these so-called third parties. Yeah. And in my view, and I'll elaborate upon what I'm, uh, uh, why I say this shortly, yeah? So these are organizations that by definition do not stand for office, yes? They're not competitors in the electoral arena. They're nevertheless participants, yeah? And they're participants that actually seek to influence electoral outcomes, yeah? By, through the spending of money. Yeah, it might be a low amount of money, but a high amount, but money is clearly an essential part in terms of the ability to influence electoral outcomes. And when I, when I say to you electoral outcomes, I don't just mean in terms of who is being elected or who is not being elected, sometimes more importantly, but also I'm talking about the agenda formation. What issues become prominent in the, in the particular election, what issues become less important, and so on and so forth. And really, what I'm getting to by saying that is that what we see uh, so it's implicit in that table, and I'll make the point more strongly now, is that there are strong general reasons for regulating third party campaigners, yeah? So they're not the same reasons that might apply to political parties and candidates, but they're reasons that flow nevertheless from the four democratic principles I outlined to you early on. So you think about corruption specifically, for example, and people say, hold on a minute, how can third party campaigners corrupt the political process. They don't hold political power. Well, they can in some ways when the spending itself becomes a, a, a threat for certain policies not being adopted or being adopted, yeah? And the example you see up in the overheads is uh, what is considered to be the, the most powerful lobby scru lobbying group in this country. And it's the Pharmacy Guild of Australia, yeah? Okay? And the fear has always been, and you see that in that, that article, that if there was a campaign run in every single chemist, in every single constituency, that, that the political party uh, would actually uh, be voted out of office, the major political party be voted out of office, and so on and so forth. Yeah? And that with clear impact on the policy making process. Fairness, yeah? We think about fairness not just in terms of, it could be partly in terms of we think about narrowly in terms of who gets elected, yeah? Uh, but also in terms of how the issues are contested. And you see examples there, yeah, that clearly uh, highlight the importance of fairness in terms of those particular aspects, whether it be the ACTU's rights at work campaign against the, the work choices legislation or the, the mining uh, companies campaign against the, uh, the mining tax and so on and so forth. Now the third principle is also important. And it's really in a way sort of an incidental collateral principle. If you have a set of regulations that only target political parties and candidates, but you leave uh, third parties unregulated, yes? Not only is it unfair, and only parties throws up a risk of uh, corruption in a particular form, what you also do is undermine the party system, yeah? Because what you then see, and this is couched often in the argument, a hydraulics uh, argument that, that uh, water finds its own level, yes? So if you, it's a highly regulated area, then political activity, or at least there's a pressure on political activity moving on to issue-based politics through third party campaigning, yeah? And less into aggregative politics that might be based on national policies and so on and so forth. Now, the fourth principle is also important, and I won't make the point here. I'll make the, uh, I'll make the point in an, uh, a slightly different way by really giving you some examples of uh, judgments that have recognized the importance of regulating third party campaigners. Yeah, all right? So you have, for example, up in the slide, uh, uh, the High Court decision in McCloy, where you're thinking about, when you think about corruption, it's also about thinking about corruption to the electoral process itself, yeah? Okay, and not just about corruption that might come about through what they call quid pro quo corruption in terms of, for example, money uh, transaction between the politician and the donor, yeah? And why, when you're concerned about the electoral process itself, and there's a quote here uh, uh, in McCloy from uh, Lord Bingham in the Animal Defenders International case, which I'll also come to in the next slide, is that we want to think about equality or level playing field also in terms of the public debate. 
not simply just be in terms of who is elected or not elected, but again, as I said, about the issues that are debated and the contest of ideas. Now again, there's a lot of text there, but just the point I'm simply making here, this is uh, Baroness Hill, where again, Animal Defenders International, yeah? That when we think about equality or level playing field, it's also about the formation of political opinion, yeah? Or, or come to the very last paragraph, it's about how we decide what policies are adopted or not adopted. And you see there too, in the, the first paragraph, there's a clear concern, not just with political parties and candidates, but also what Baroness Hill describes as pressure groups. From Canada, yeah? We can understand why we have a concern, not just about parties and candidates, but also third parties. It's because when you think about equality, it's a, not about equality amongst organizations. It's political equality is fundamentally about equality of individuals, yes? And individuals, of course, might participate in organizations, but it's really the individuals that are really the moral unit of the principle of political equality. So for me, third party campaigning should be regulated yeah, at least that general considerations pointing to, the, uh, to supporting the regulation of third party campaigning. But nevertheless, in terms of how you choose to regulate it, you must keenly bear in mind the salient differences between third party uh, campaigning and political parties. Yeah, right? And you can read this much more quickly uh, than, um, uh, than me expressing it. But the point of that particular side is simply to say this. Yeah, we've got more complex organizational profiles in terms of third party campaigners. We have much more varied sources of income compared to political parties, yeah? And not only that, political activities, even if broadly understood, often do not form uh, all of the activities of the third parties, yeah? There'll be various activities that we can describe as non-political, yeah? Now, this has two implications. One is that, The challenge of compliance for a third party because of the very sources of income, there are more complex organizational profiles and uh, more varied activities, means that the challenge of compliance is much more, diff more uh, acute than for political parties, which are much more unidimensional organizational. Yeah? Their political organizations to stand for office, they often rely upon mainly in the main income uh, donation or uh, supplemented by public funding in terms of their income, yeah? And the second implication, of course, is the risk of adverse impact upon the non-political activities of third parties, even when you choose, even if you decide to go on a path of regulating their political activities. And for me, is these differences and the implications they give rise that lead me to the conclusion that yes, there are general considerations for regulating third parties, but only third parties that incur a significant amount of political expenditure should be regulated. Yeah? And indeed, uh, you see similar comments actually uh, being made by the current uh, Special Minister uh, of State, uh, Matthias Common. Yeah? Uh, when he says that uh, it's only those who actually, uh, he says that those incurring significant political expenditure are those who should be regulated. And of course then now then it moves on to the question what actually constitutes significant, yeah? The other conclusion I've, re I've reached from that, uh, this analysis is that only, firstly, only third parties incurring significant amount of political expenditure should be regulated. And secondly, generally speaking, that level of regulation should be less than that applies to political parties. Given their different the organizational profiles, their varied sources, the risk of adverse impact in terms of their non-political activities. Now, having set the scene, let me come to the two components of the bill I'd like to focus on. One is the registration uh, uh, scheme, and then moving on to the restrictions on foreign political donations. 
And here I'm going to impose on you. I've got this, uh, uh, it's a complex piece of legislation, but what I've done in some of these tables is try to sort of summarize uh, what the current position is and what changes uh, the bill actually makes, yeah? And if you look at, uh, I'm not sure how your tables went, but I think it's page five of my submission. What you see there is that um, there's presently no registration regime in terms of third party campaigners and political campaigners. But what the uh, bill proposes to do is that it proposes to uh, impose a registration requirement for third party campaigners. And third party campaigners are essentially will be defined as organizations that spend above the disclosure threshold. Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. That incur political expenditure that's above the disclosure threshold. Yeah? All right. I'll come to the definition of political expenditure shortly, but let me just explain the disclosure threshold. The disclosure threshold is a threshold at which uh, political parties and candidates are required to itemize yeah, uh, certain donations. The amount, the name and address of the donor, so on and so forth. Yeah? It's an index amount which currently stands at 13,500. Yeah? So upshot of all this is that if you're an organization that spends 13,500 or more per annum, on political expenditure, yeah, you're required to register under the bill. Yeah. Now, what the, um, the bill also does is that it creates a different registration requirement for what are called political campaigners. Yeah? And an organization of political campaigner, if it spends more than $100,000 uh, per annum yeah, on political expenditure. Yeah? There's also another limp of, of becoming a political campaigner that's a bit complicated, but I'll leave that aside for the time being, yeah? So I think uh, just to simplify matters, to get, uh, get uh, communicate the, the, the gist of this complex legislation more simply, think about it as just basically a different levels of expenditure, yeah? Now, the spending is what's called on political expenditure, yeah? And you see it extracted in that slide uh, 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 rather short. No, not really. Uh, definition of political expenditure. Yeah. So political expenditure is expenditure incurred for one more political purposes, and then political purposes is then defined. Yeah. So the first limb of political purpose essentially is when you engage in public expression on a view uh, relating to a party, a candidate, so on and so forth. B is the one that's been causing a bit of consternation. Yeah. So B is when you uh, engage in public expression by means of any views on an issue, yeah? So not on a political party directly, or part, but an issue that is or likely to be before electors in election. Yeah. I'm not gonna dwell on C, uh, C D, and E, yeah? Uh, in, in many ways, they overlap with A and B, but uh, so we can just, if you can just focus on A and B, this is where the controversy is sent, uh, centered. Now, before I, um, uh, uh, before I leave that part of the definition, I just want to note two things. One is that the definition of political expenditure says it means expenditure for one or more political purposes, yeah? The second thing to note is that this actually is not a terribly new definition, yeah? All right, so uh, for the most part, this definition has been in existence since uh, 2006, yeah? There's been some amendments uh, made by a legisla uh, 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 legislation passed last year, and the amendments are basically the underlying bits uh, of the text under B, yeah? But otherwise, this is something that's been in existence for, uh, since 2006. Now, I support a registration scheme, broadly speaking, yeah? I support it. Uh, for two reasons. One is that, and again, in the context where I think that it's only third parties that incur significant political expenditures should be regulated, yeah? One is that I think voters are entitled to know who are the significant political actors, yeah? And the registration scheme actually provides that degree of transparency. The second reason is that a registration scheme also uh, facilitates compliance or facilitates the compliance efforts of the regulatory authority by being able to identify which, which are the significant uh, political actors in this particular space. However, I think there are real difficulties the bill has currently proposed. 
the thresholds are way too low. Yeah? So think about third party campaigner threshold. It's thirteen thousand five hundred dollars per annum. It's hard to hard for me to accept that this is a significant amount of political expenditure. Not only that, it's also a misuse of the disclosure threshold. The disclosure threshold is a concept used to, seek, to identify the particular sums which more details need to be disclosed. Whereas it's being used in a different way to identify actors to be regulated. Yeah? So for my part, I would increase the threshold much higher to about 100. Again, there's always a degree of judgment and arbitrariness in this. One's got to do it. But uh, if you look at my submission, it's really in a way based uh, uh, also partly an inductive process, looking at what the current uh, levels of spending by third parties are. I would say that $100,000 per annum, that could reasonably be seen as a significant amount of political expenditure. And then if you go up to about $2 million per annum, uh, I think there's justification for an increased level of, of, of regulation. And based on the current returns, $2 million per annum will catch about, if I'm not mistaken, five organizations. Yeah? So get up amongst them. Uh, I think M Minerals Council and also a, um, uh, a group that's been set up by the, the mining industry. I think, I, haven't, I think it's called ACA Low Emissions Technology, something along those lines. Yeah? What I also recommend is that I think with the current definition of political expenditure is flawed. And it's flawed because the, the use of the word for introduces an undesirable degree of imprecision for two reasons. Yeah? One is that it suggests that it's really about the motivation that's a touchstone of this definition. And once you go into the realm of subject, uh, such subjective considerations like motivation, it really can give rise to difficulties in terms of compliance. Now, the other aspect of the position is that it introduces a really an unclear question about what is the requisite nexus or the degrees of connection. Yeah? What I mean by that is this. So you've got political purpose, which is say, take for example, public expression. Yes? Okay? So you run an ad. Uh, say, vote for the Labour Party. Fine, that's in A. And that counts as political expenditure. But what about the time you spend researching what would make good messaging? Or let's take it even further. What about the uh, general staffing costs for the person who's actually drafted the ad? Human resource management, accounting, so on and so forth. Or go even further. What about the rent you paid for the particular accommodation. How you treat items like that. My solution, I think, is simple but uh, hopefully effective, is that for should be replaced with on. Yeah? So if you spend money directly on those items, ads, right, staff, staff to which are, who are engaged uh, primarily in campaigning, if you like the public interface in terms of politics, then there's political expenditure. Yeah? Expenditure that, if you like, leads up to it or incidental is not caught, uh, will not be caught if four is replaced by on. Okay. Let me come to the most uh, controversial aspects of this bill, the so-called the restrictions relating to foreign political donations. In a recent article that I wrote for the King's Law Journal, um, a key point I made was that we have to be clear about what we mean by foreign, and that the different meanings of foreign give rise to quite different rationales for regulating. Yeah? And what I pointed out was that there are three different meanings of foreign when we talk about a ban on foreign political donations. So there's foreign in the sense that money is coming from overseas, geographically overseas, yeah? So we think about foreign bank accounts and so on and so forth. There's foreign in the sense of the specific meaning of foreign governments, yeah? So we see, of course, that in the controversies uh, 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 relating to the Chinese Communist Party government. And the third, most contentious and most amorphous, 
is foreign in the sense that there are individuals and entities that are seen as somehow not properly part of the body politic. Yeah? yeah, I know that's vague, but I'll come to what I mean by shortly. Now, when you analyze the bill according to these separate meanings, yeah? So what you see from the, uh, f from the bill, and um, this is illustrated in uh, the tables that you have, um, according to my submission, sort of page 9 to 11, yeah? Is that it bans receipt for foreign bank accounts for key political organizations, yeah? Now, what is the rationale here? The rationale here is not that those giving money f uh, from overseas are necessarily considered to be illegitimate or uh, are seen not to be entitled to participate in the political process. The rationale here is that foreign bank accounts throw up an obvious risk of money laundering. Yeah? That the reach of the regulatory authorities do not extend so far as, as to foreign countries. So when there's money coming, say, from Hong Kong or from the United States, the regulatory authority does not have the assurance, n neither does it have the assurance or the wherewithal to actually be fully assured yeah, that that money actually is coming from that particular person. They could have been coming from somebody else and just uh, circulated through the foreign bank accounts. Yeah? So the risk here is about money, money laundering. So I support that measure for that particular reason. And indeed, I would actually extend it further than what the bill proposes. Yeah? The bill, for example, doesn't include associated entities, and I think that's a very striking omission. Uh, I would also include, it, uh, include uh, organizations that are registered either under the Austrian Charities, uh, Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Act, or uh, as well as those registered under the Fair Work Act, which are currently exempted under the bill. Because the risk of money laundering also pertains to all these different organizations. But what I will add to that particular bill is this, that if the recipient can demonstrate that the name donor is the true and accurate donor to the satisfaction of the Australian Electoral Commission, then the prohibition is lifted. And again, this pertains to the rationale. The rationale is about addressing money laundering. It's not about saying that that money is necessarily illegitimate. Yeah? Now, with the other two sets of restrictions, and the restrictions dealing with foreign governments and others in the uh, individuals, entities that considered not to be uh, properly part of the body politic of Australia. Yeah? Okay. Now, the way in which the bill deals with it, again, through another complicated legislation, is that it essentially says, uh, and the restrictions vary. You see from the table that, uh, in fact, there are four different lay lev tiers of regulation, and I'll come to that shortly. Yeah? But essentially, it broadly speaking, it imposes restrictions relating to allowable donors. So broadly speaking, it's only allowable donors that are allowed to donate, yes? Now, who are the allowable donors? Uh, these are individuals who are electors, those who have the ability to vote, those who are considered citizens, yeah? In the first instance, Australian residents, or, or what is defined as a bill as Australian permanent residents. I say in the first instance because if you see in subsection two there of that particular slide, it says the minister by, may by less living instrument determine that Australian residents are not allowable, allowable donors. Yeah? Allowable donors do not just extend to natural persons. What you see in subsection B of that particular definition that is that if you're an entity that's incorporated in this country, you're an allowable donor. Um, if you're not incorporated by your head office or principal place of business is in this country, you're an allowable donor. Yeah? Now, what the definition expressly excludes for being an allowable donor uh, through subsection 3, and I'll just summarize it really, is that foreign governments, yeah? Or parts of foreign governments, and as well as state-owned uh, state uh, uh, public enterprises. We can analyze these restrictions dealing with allowable donors in, according to two lenses, yeah? The first is to say, well, it deals with foreign governments, yeah? And I think the rationale here is strong, yes? Yeah? I think uh, when we think about, uh, of course, there should be interaction between foreign governments, yes? 
but foreign governments should interact with each other as foreign governments, yes? Yeah? They should interact with each other after the governments are formed. Foreign governments should not be influencing our political process in the process of the formation of government, yes? Yeah. And it's a nice quote here from the Prime Minister saying, look, this is not just about China, yes? All right? This is about all foreign governments. This is something I strongly support. What I'm strongly opposed to, and this is really the most egregious aspect of the bill, are the restrictions dealing with non-allowable donors other than foreign governments. Yeah? And if these restrictions are enacted, I think they'll do quite, they'll inflict very deep damage to Aust the fabric of Australian democracy. Now, there are five reasons, yeah? why I don't support these restrictions. These restrictions rest upon the rationale that they deal with so-called foreign interference Australian politics. But the stark fact is this. The two donors that were the center of controversy in terms of this so-called foreign interference will still very much be able to donate even if this bill is passed, enacted in whole. Why is that? Chow Chuck Wing has been for decades an Australian citizen. Yeah? Huang Xiang Mo is a permanent resident. And not only that, I suspect many of the companies would also be able to donate even if the bill is enacted in total. Yeah? So take, for example, uh, Yuhu Group, which is the main company of Huang Xiang Mo. This is a property development, uh, property development company uh, that is based in New South Wales. Um, I would say with some degree of confidence that it's either incorporated in Australia or its principal place of activity or head office in Australia. Yeah. So the justification of these restrictions in terms of being targeting foreign interference is one that doesn't hold. And worse than that, and this comes to the second reason, it the justification for these uh, provisions understands meaningful connection or the Australian political community too narrowly. Yes? So let me approach this in a sort of slightly circuitous way. Under Section 24 of the Constitution, uh, second paragraph of Section 24 of the Constitution, it says this uh, provision that basically says uh, uh, that the number of the House of Representatives seats should be calculated according to the population of the particular state. Yes, right? And, and essentially, uh, what's happened through legislative uh, enactment is that the number of people in a particular state is calculated according to ABS, the latest ABS statistics. Now, the ABS uses what's called a 12-month rule. The 12-month rule is simply stated. It counts as a person as being within the population of the state or in this country more generally. So you think about the population clock that we, uh, you might have looked at uh, uh, every so often. It counts a person as within that population if they've stayed in this country for 12 months or intend to stay in this country for 12 months. So this would include permanent residents which are placed in a precarious position by this bill in the sense that they can be excluded a denied ability to donate uh, by, by a lesser instrument, but it includes a, a group that's clearly uh, excluded by this bill. Long-term residents on temporary visas, yeah? So you think, for example, international students, or you think, for example, of workers on what used to be uh, uh, the 457 visa, on what's now called the temporary skill shortages visa, yeah? These are people who have been resident in this country for a long time, and in my strong view, while they might not have the ability to vote, they nevertheless should have the ability to influence the political process. In the words of Dennis Thompson, an American philosopher, they're, they're not electoral constituents, but they're nevertheless moral constituents. The third point, and I'll put it this way, Compare, for example, we think about a cap on political donations, yeah? If an organization had to comply with a cap on political donation, the organization should be able to ascertain from the transaction itself whether the cap has been breached or not, yes? Because let's say $2,000, has Zim given me $2,000 over the financial year or not, yes? It's gonna be apparent from the transaction itself, yes? 
and through proper accounting practices. But when you have a, a restriction that turns on the status of the donor, the status of the donor is not going to be readily apparent from the transaction itself. Zim gives me money. How do I know whether it's a citizen or not? It's not going to be apparent, yes? So there are going to be requirements for further mechanisms, all right, further investigations, further compliance costs, yeah? So for example, the bill actually insists that in some, uh, for particular organizations, they need to have to receive, uh, uh, if they receive an amount more than $250, there needs to be a statutory declaration that Zim is not, uh, that, that Zim is a allowable donor. Now, this is going to be, a, this is a disproportionate compliance burden in two ways. I think the burden exceeds whatever benefit uh, this, uh, flows from the, restric uh, from the restrictions. And secondly, it's disproportionate in the sense it, of course, will fall more heavily on less resource organizations. Yeah? And it also fall more heavily on organizations that, res that rely upon smaller amounts, smaller donations. Because it's those organizations when you just say, look, Zim wants to give me $50, and I say to him, okay, uh, no, he wants to give me t um, uh, $300 in a financial year, and I say to him, look, you've got to sign a step deck. Yeah? Now, for many donors, that might be sufficient disincentive not to actually donate, especially if you're donating a modest amount. The fourth dot point, and I'll just be brief on this, um, but I'm happy to talk about it much more in, in, uh, in discussion. I think uh, there are aspects of this bill that are constitutionally suspect. I think the exclusion in terms of permanent residence makes it constitutionally suspect. But in many ways, I think the government, thanks, the government has actually learned, yeah? The government has actually learned from the, the High Court decision in Unions in South Wales. So while there might be arguments that some provisions of these are, are constitutionally valid, I, I don't think they're very strong ones. I'll leave the last one for later, yeah? Well, let me come to the questions that um, are said in terms of seminar. Does it deal with foreign interference? Yes, if foreign governments are giving directly, yes? But that, I think, is gonna be very unlikely. More likely, when we think about the influence of foreign governments, they're more likely to occur through intermediaries, yeah? And we had allegations of this kind made recently in Fairfax Media where, uh, 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 I won't go into the details because of time, but involving uh, New South Wales uh, um, uh, Minerals Minister Chris Harcher, yeah? And the, the approach was made through a businessman on behalf of a Chinese state-owned enterprise, yeah? So yes, the bill will catch this, but no, the bill won't catch sympathetic donors, yeah? Sympathetic donors who are independently wealthy, yeah? Like Huang Xiangmo or Chao Chakwing, yeah? And indeed, and again, I won't go into detail, when you look at, uh, I think, and I really encourage you to look at, the submission made by Clive Hamilton and Alex Joski to the, uh, one of the other bills, which details the activities of the United Front Department, which is a, a department within the Chinese Communist Party government, it's really about uh, the exercise of soft power is not about Beijing, you know, throwing its weight around, but it's really about getting people whose sympathies or interests align with the Beijing agenda to actually act in concert. Let me spend just five minutes coming to the other question. Does it stifle the political advocacy of charities? And you, many of you might have seen the reportage. This is strong. Uh, there's been really a strong opposition by the charities, and a strong opposition is just issued in a call that the charity charities should be exempted, yeah, from the provisions of the bill, yeah. And indeed, you see from that slide that it's not just registered charities calling for an exemption. There's a whole range of organisations, the Law Council, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, calling for an exemption for registered charities. I'm strongly opposed to this exemption, yeah? And the way I'm gonna flesh out my opposition is really by tackling what are the arguments made for this exemption, yeah? And it seems to me there are four separate arguments, yeah? One is that registered charities should be exempted because they're acting in the public interest when they're engaging in political advocacy, yeah? And you see examples of that in the slide there. It's strongly implicit in these submissions. In my view, 
this is a non sequitur. Political actors and political organizations overwhelmingly are acting upon their understanding of public interests, including registered charities. Yeah? So it's not an argument for exemption. And indeed, when we think about it, one of the reasons, when we come to one of the principles uh, I enumerated early on, we think about fairness in terms of politics is also about the, and also the various case law for the Animal Defenders International, Harper, McCloy, is about the fair contest in ideas or different understandings of the public interest. Second argument, the advocacy the rest of charities engage in which are typically what's called issue advocacy. So it's not about vote for ALP or don't vote for the coalition, but maybe you know, uh, put one more money for the homeless or, you know, uh, or, and so on and so forth. What you see some of the arguments made is that that kind of advocacy is not political. Yeah? So you have uh, examples there in terms of the submissions. These are very strongly held views, and I've had conversations with people in the charity sector who, who have very strongly believed this, yes? But I must say, I still find it a very odd argument, yes? To characterize this kind of advocacy as not being political. As I put in the slide, is the Stop Adani Mine campaign apolitical or not political? It defies credibility to say it's not political, yeah? And we think about what is politics. Politics, of course, includes not just about, in the point I was making, you know, not just who is elected and so on and so on, but also the governmental process. Yeah? It's also about agenda formation. It's hard to resist the characterization that this advocacy is political. It is not partisan, but it's nevertheless political. And let me try to get support from a different direction. You see in some of the submission, there's a, a fabulous reference to the High Court decision in Aid Watch to point, rightly point, to the valuable role played by issue advocacy or by, or the, by the uh, advocacy of charities in terms of uh, opposing or promoting particular laws, yeah? But what you can also draw out from that particular decision is that it's precisely because that advocacy is seen as political that it is valuable, yeah? Because it's political communication under our constitutional prescribed system as, that underlines its value or put it in a different way. What was rejected in that particular decision is that the mere fact that a charity engages in a political object, yeah, and this was the um, court interacting with uh, trust law, inter as, uh, interpreting the statute but, uh, and its interaction with the trust law is that the mere fact it had a political object dis not, did not disqualify a charity from, uh, sorry, did not disqualify a, an organization from being a charity which clearly implies they can have a political object, or at least some can have a political object. The bill wrongly labels them as partisan. So you see various submissions here, yeah? And this really, I think a lot of these arguments hinge upon the definition of political expenditure, yeah? Again, I find this to be a curious, uh, curious argument, yeah, all right? You've got a definition of political expenditure as various limbs. Some deal with partisan advocacy, some deal with issue advocacy. The mere fact you satisfy one element, I would have thought leads to a necessary inference that you satisfy the other element. So I find this a curious argument. I think the most substantial argument is this. Yeah, it's not about the nature of the advocacy that uh, organized, uh, the charities are undertaking. It's not about confusion is that its impact will be the diminishing of political advocacy by the charities. And you actually see a complex series of arguments here, okay? And I'm, I'm gone way over time, so I'll, I'll come to what actually is, the, I think, the more substantial arguments, yeah? One is really about the compliance burden placed by the bill, yeah? That, that compliance burden will actually mean a stifling of political advocacy. When you look at the, and I, I'm not sure whether you can read the, the, the tiny text on the, less, the, less, the, the overheads, I think it's important to be specific about which provisions are occasioning difficulty. Some of these provisions will actually be quite easy to comply with, yeah? But the provisions that actually give rise to most difficulty, in my view, are the restrictions dealing with non-allowable donors. 
for the reasons I just explained, yes? When compliance is not going to be easy because the status of the donor is not going to be apparent from the transaction itself. I think that is the most significant argument. There are another argument, and it's not expressly made, but I think it's out there, and uh, it's something I'll float, and I'm not sure about this. And it's distinct from the argument about compliance burden. It's an argument really that rests upon the patterns of funding of registered charities. That for many, or at least a significant number of them, they, they rely to a great degree on foreign funding. And that these restrictions, even if they're easy to comply with, will mean a cutting or a severe reduction in the flow of money. Look, I'm not sure whether this is the case or not. I haven't seen the figures, and it's, I don't, maybe there aren't figures about the extent of reliance on foreign funding. But if it's the case, then of course I think at the very least uh, uh, it's incumbent upon uh, the policymakers to investigate what's the extent of reliance of the charity sector on foreign funding and what the bill would do in terms of the flow of money to charities. But at the same time, I think it, if it's the case, and I'm not sure about this, I'll raise it as a question, there's significant reliance on foreign funding by the charity sector for its advocacy, yeah? So I'm not talking about non-political activities for its advocacy. I think it raises serious questions too for the health of the charity sector, the health of Australia's democracy, yeah? There's reference in the submissions, for example, to international philanthropy. Uh, I'll be asking more questions. Who are the, back, who are the people behind such philanthropic efforts? And specifically, what are their agendas? Let me, let me finish up here. Does the bill stifle the political advocacy of charity? I think it does, and partly because of the problems with definition of political expenditure, but really in the main because of these restrictions dealing with allow allowable donors other than for foreign governments. But none of that justifies an exemption for charities. Yeah? They do justify dealing with those specific concerns, but none of that justifies an exemption for charities. Because when you think about the arguments made for the exemption, they could equally apply to other organizations, other groups. So if you start exempting charities because you say issue advocacy is not political advocacy, for example, why not exempt the Minerals Council of Australia? Why not exempt the various companies which are engaged in issue advocacy? What I'll finish up by saying is this, that the general measures I propose in recommendations I think go a long way to alleviating the concerns about the impact of the bill on the rest of charities. And in my mind, I think general measures uh, can sometimes be much more effective in dealing with specific concerns than very targeted exemptions. Thank you.